Okay, so welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us today for the fourth part of our webinar series, um, which is around memorable teaching moments. Um, so this author webinar today, I'm very excited, is going to be facilitating, so I'll be facilitating four of our market leading authors. So we have John Sloman, from can do a wave, uh, Dean Garrett, John Guest and Elizabeth Jones. So today's session is called Learning Economics by Doing Economics. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emma Gadsden, and I'm the product manager for the economics list at Pearson. So let me just briefly introduce you to our wonderful presenters today, who are the authors of our market leading titles, Economics, Essentials of Economics, Economics for Business, and Essentials of Economics for Business. I knew I was going to stumble on those ones. <laughs> um, so we have John Sloman, who was the director for the Economics Network from its foundation in 1999 until 2012. And John is now a visiting fellow at the University of Bristol, where the university was based, the network was based, as well as a visiting professor at the University of the West of England in Bristol. We have Dean Garrett, who's a senior teaching fellow at Aston Business School, an associate of the Economics Network. Dean is also an academic assessor for the Government Economic Service and a tutor for HM Treasury's Graduate Development Programme. John Guest, who is a National F Teaching Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a Senior Teaching Fellow at Aston Business School. John is also a Senior Associate of the Economics Network and a Teaching Associate at Warwick Business School and an Academic Assessor for the Government Economic Service. And last but not least, Elizabeth Jones, who is a Professor of Economics and the Director of Undergraduate Studies at the Department of Economics at the University of Warwick. Elizabeth is also a lecturer on HM Treasury's Graduate Development Programme and teaches economics for non-economists uh, courses across a variety of government departments. So thank you so much for being here today, all four of you. We're so excited that everyone can join us today. Uh, just before we start, I have to do a little bit of housekeeping and then I will pass over to the team. So as we know in webinars, sometimes we'll end up having a little bit of background noise. So everybody has been put onto mute so that everyone can hear our wonderful presenters today. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand. There's a button at the bottom of your screens and one of our colleagues will be able to take you off mute so you can ask questions. Um, a huge thank you to those of you who have pre-submitted questions. We've tried to incorporate these into the agenda where we can, but if anything's not covered, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, and we would love for this to be interactive. So please do chime in. And if you think of any questions, put them into the chat and we'll try and answer them as we go. Or as I say, there will be Q&A at the end. If you're interested in getting a sample copy or a demo of any of the work that we're going to talk about today from these authors, then please do get in touch with us after the webinar and we can talk you through how to do that. And there will be a recording shared with everybody in about a week's time together with a summary of our session so that if you need to get in touch, you'll know how. So that's it from me. I'm going to pass over to our great panel now. Well, shall I start as I've been? Please do, John. <clears throat> Yeah, um, well, I started teaching uh, at the University of the West of England, or Bristol Polytechnic, as it was then, back in 1971. And I suppose my first memorable moment was to realise that students aren't containers. Uh, it's very easy when you've got a serried rank of students sitting in front of you in a lecture to think that what you say actually goes in. You sort of imagine that students have got lids on their heads and you pour an hour's worth of knowledge in. And at the end of the lecture, you close the lid, they walk out an hour wiser than they came in, which, of course, is total nonsense. Um, learning is not like that. And, and I think my first memorable moment was to realise that teaching is different from learning. Uh, just because you've said it, just because you've so-called taught it in inverted commas doesn't necessarily mean that students have learnt it. So, so for me, it was very much thinking about the learning process in all the sorts of classes you were given and whether you could perhaps alter those classes in various ways. So one thing was to think about the lecture, whether a lecture is just a talk for 50 minutes or an hour or whatever, whatever the length of time you've been allocated for that lecture. Um, and my first feeling was, as, as, you, as you sit there for that hour, you're concentration gradually wanes, your ability to learn wanes, um, and therefore you need to be interested, you need to be doing things, you need to be active, that learning needs to be an active process. And so the whole series of things I try to introduce in lectures, uh, for example, having a break. Um, 
I remember back all oh, at the second year I was teaching in those days, polytechnics had inspectors who used to come from outside. An inspector said to me after the first session, he said, oh, he said, well, that was very good. But he said, um, have you ever thought of giving a break in the middle of the lecture? So I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So I did from then onwards. And uh, I used to like showing them cartoons, totally unrelated to the lecture, but uh, at least it gave them a break and then they could start off again. Anyway, about five years later, he came back and he he, he visited and I, I duly gave a break in the middle of the lecture. And he pulled me aside after he said, he said, that was a really good idea, giving them break in the lectures. He said, where did you get that from? <laughs> so I then had to tell him it was actually, it was you who suggested it in the first place. But those breaks can be all sorts of things. You can get students to do exercises. You can you know, ask them questions. And with modern technology, like, like um, an audience response system, whether it's using clickers or whether it's using your smart devices, phones, laptops, tablets, whatever, you can set questions and the students can answer them, display them on the screen. That completely makes a lecture come alive. And it was that, that thought of making a session come alive, making it fun, getting students to talk to each other in a lecture, permitting that process. So stopping for five minutes, perhaps getting students to look at each other's notes, comparing ideas, the whole series of things you can do in lectures. Let me just show you a list um, here. Here was a list I made of, of various activities you, you, you can do with students. So rest, reading notes, read each other's notes, ask, can you all see it? Yeah. Yes. Um, we can just scan down the whole series of things. We can make these available after the webinar, but that's just an example of the sorts of things you can do in a lecture. One fun thing was to get another lecture from, from the department to just burst into your lecture halfway through and just do a little little something with the students. So that the students thought that's great, great fun. Um, so make it theatre, make it fun, make it so the students are engaged and want to come so they enjoy the experience because if you're enjoying it, they're gonna learn so much more. So that, that, was, that was one lesson I took. Um, Another one is, is to make it relevant to the real world. Um, it's too easy to do theoretical economics and to do imaginary examples that fit the model rather than talking about the messy real world and how models can at least partially explain it and then what the weaknesses of the model are in explaining what's in the real world. And that's a much more useful learning experience for students than some sort of just, just imaginary examples. And there are all sorts of ways you can do it. You, you can read something to them. You can show them a video or, or, or stream something from online. There are all sorts of ways you can give little examples of things, which again, make it fun. You can get students to find their own examples. So you say to students, the next lecture we're going to do such and such, I want you to find an example of this and bring it to the lecture. So at least it's made them think about the real world when they come to it. So, so peppering it, what you're doing with the real world. Um, and then another thing I thought, Students need to be doing things. So why not make a workshop um, a way that students can do things in a, lecture, in a lecture time? So maybe making half the lecture a workshop. You can put the questions on the screen. You can give out a workshop sheet. Maybe students work I mean, in pairs. You can go through them from the front. Um, they can use their devices to, if it's, it's simple answers like multiple choice questions, they can vote on them. But if it's calculations, you can go through them on 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 the screen at the front so making part of the time listening part of the time a workshop and one of the modern ideas is the flipping the classroom this the, the, the term came from america where typically classes in, in in most subjects are just a single large class you don't split them into lectures and seminars but you just have the the, the single large class and typically students would be having essentially a lecture in that class, maybe one or two things to do, and then they go away and do some work on their own. And the idea of the flip classroom was you, you pre-record something or get students to do some work, and then they come to the class and do work in the class. So um, in, in, certainly in the UK system, which has both lectures and seminars and other, other types of classes, you can certainly do much more activity within the lecture environment and get students to do things prior to that. And certainly with, with, with pre-recording materials, it doesn't have to be pre-recording the whole lecture. It could be record, 
making little 10 minute videos that you want the students to watch two or three 10 minute videos, maybe on theoretical concepts or something to do with an example. They watch them pr prior to the lecture and then come and do, do that. Um, and then in terms of seminars, just making it fun, making it active, making it theater. One of the best things you can do in seminars if it's policy related is to have a debate, have a formal debate or have an inquisition, have, have, have um, so we've got the COVID inquiry coming along at the moment in the UK. You could have some inquiry, something like an environmental inquiry or, or, or looking at, uh, well, I mean, today the Competition and Markets Authority has released a report which says there are um, uh, problems in, in supermarkets of a lot of branded products um, going up more than the rate of inflation, that, that the, the, the producers of branded products has used this as an excuse to put up their prices beyond cost. Well, you could take examples like this and, and, and turn them into a debate. It could be a formal debate with speakers on either side, you could have voting from the floor. Um, make, make a seminar um, an exciting and interesting, bring an element of theatre to it. So these were sort of the learning moments I had, and, and students do learn better if they're engaged in this sort of way, so that learning is an active process. I'll shut up there. <laughs> like, you to time, John. Don't Thank talk you. too much. <laughs> I just coming on something actually, just a couple of little things that John's just said. So, um, if you're one thing I started doing a few years ago, and I watched somebody do this, and I thought, wow, that's a better idea. So, like John mentioned, you, you want students to talk in, in even big classrooms. You don't just want them sat there passively. And, um, you know, people use polling software. And um, I can't remember, I think it was Fabio at UEA. I watched him do a class, and he, and I do this all the time, so he, would, he would use his polling software in an interesting way. So he'd ask a question, and he'd have them answer individually. Okay. And he'd show them the breakdown of their answers, but he wouldn't show them what the, the correct answer, if there was one, uh, was. And then he'd say to the students, right, now I want you to talk to the person next to you and discuss what answers you gave. Did you give the same answer? Did you give different answers? And then I'm going to get you to poll again once you've had a discussion about this with the other student. And then we can compare what happens. And what I liked about that activity is the initial poll made them think about a problem for a minute or two. And then, so you've got them thinking and not just sat down passively. And then you, you know, you got them talking to somebody next to them who'd been forced to think about this issue for a minute and to discuss an idea. And obviously in the idea world, you quite like it if they had different answers and they could discuss their answers. And then you could show how the, the pattern of answers had maybe changed uh, before revealing anything. And I, I thought that was a really nice little practical tip um, of how instead of just sort of using polling, get them all to do individually, how you could use polling to actually then encourage some discussion between students. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you, if you've got two, three hundred people in a room, it, it is quite difficult to encourage them to discuss. And this was a this was a real sort of nice concrete example. And because I mean students quite like the polling, so it was quite a nice thing to say, oh, what did you put? You know, have a chat about it and then and then re-poll again. Um, so I think that's uh, that's quite a nice way of using that technology, but still trying to get some discussion going um, uh, uh, in a large classroom. I think, and I'll shut up in a minute, but just going back to the other thing Tom, uh, John said, um, I think COVID has had a big impact on our ability to generate videos. Okay, and we learn a lot how to do uh, short videos. And um, and I... I, I think I, I, I'm not sure I flip the classroom. I sort of I, I sort of do some version of flipping. Mm. Um, I'm a I'm a I don't know what you call it, Dean. I'm sort of on <laughs> what do you say, Dean? I'm partly, <laughs> I'm partly flipped, is what uh, I'm not probably. going there, John. No, I thought I did well. Um, and and so, but it is quite useful because you can it it it. I think John, what John said, I really identify with. I think that you feel a sort of pressure when you mm. teach that if you don't say it, they can't learn it. And I've got, if I do all this interactive, a lot of, a lot of um, comments of some of my colleagues would be, well, all this interactive stuff in the classroom is all very well, but I won't cover enough stuff because, mm. it's you know, and there's this sort of debate about, well, is it really about what I'm covering or what they're learning? And, you know, you, you could have an interesting debate about that. But even if you felt like you still wanted to cover a bit more material, the videos give you a sort of license to take stuff out of the classroom and focus more time on interactive activities uh, uh, in the classroom. And we have undoubtedly got better 
uh, the short videos. One thing I think we quickly all learned from experience was anything over 10 minutes was a waste of time. Um, the videos really need to be five to 10 minutes because they, they, that, that's, that's sort of the ideal time for a, and then they had a bit of, bit of thought to maybe how you break things up in the five, 10 minute slots. Um, so that, yeah, they're just a few thoughts that hopefully sort of uh, complement the sort of things um, uh, that John was saying. Okay, should I step in for a minute? Um, when Erzibet and Emma emailed a couple of months ago and said, um, could you identify a memorable moment? I think it was one of those moments when actually at the time things didn't go very well. And it was then being the reflective practitioner and working out what had gone wrong. And let me tell you why it had gone so badly wrong. I was teaching a group of um, sports scientists, I think they were, so they were non-specialists. And I was essentially given carte blanche with this module to, to teach whatever I wanted within, uh, obviously, an economics flavour. And I just couldn't, couldn't get the group to particularly engage. And what, it soon became, what soon became apparent is I'd fallen into that sort of um, what sometimes we call the hard bias in economics. There is a particular, it, it, I mean, John talked about a particular content we should deliver. I, I would argue it's not just the content, is it? It's also, we, we're, we're often told we have to deliver it in a particular way, a very technical way. And I was doing this with non-specialists. So one of the questions I think was sent to Elizabeth was about how we might adapt our teaching to non-specialists. Well, certainly not um, demonstrating the sort of technical or hard bias that we might ordinarily do, and we could discuss whether that's right with, with, um, with, with economists themselves. And the reason that um, it dawned on me that I was demonstrating this hard bias then, and it was certainly not encouraging an empathy. Well, I wasn't empathising with the audience. They weren't empathising with the discipline of economics. And what made it a big irony is if I told you I'd just come back to teaching, this would be 2001, teaching up in Nottingham, and I'd been working at the Treasury for just shy of four years as a professional economist. And essentially, I'd gone from being the professional economist, policy orientated, and I'd almost gone back into the academic mindset, almost like that. It was almost like a switch. The second I walked back into a, into a classroom, anything that I might have experienced as an economist, as a professional, just got completely binned. Mm -hmm. And I, I went back to being this, you know, technically proficient. You could discuss that, but certainly that was what I was trying to demonstrate. And so for me, the, 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 I think John used the word learnings, didn't you, John, earlier? The, the mm -hmm. learning that I took very, very... Well, I, I would like to say it happened overnight. I think it took time to recognize that you, you have to demonstrate according to your audience. You have to be empathetic. You have to know your audience. And I think you have to have the confidence to recognize that not everyone, and that includes students who are studying economics, have the same passion, desire for economics as we do. I think that's certainly one thing. And part, part of what we're doing, John was talking about theatre and whatever, and I think you're absolutely right, is we have to demonstrate a passion and show why our economics is relevant. And that's particularly important for non-economists. But something a bit more than that, having been a, a, a professional economist for a while, it, it, dawned, it slowly dawned on me, why is it that I'm teaching even um, our sort of um, specialist economists in a very different way to the way that would perhaps be expected of them when these um, students graduate and become academic or professional economists themselves. Why is there this disconnect between the experience that I had as an economist mm -hmm. and what we're actually doing to our students? I mean, John again talked about we, we can often deliver, if we're not careful, modules that are technically proficient, but are abstract, very theoretical, and not demonstrate sufficiently and consistently the relevance of what we're doing, the sort of employability angle um, in my early years, and certainly when I was teaching these um, non-specialists was, was really evident. So I think having the, the confidence sometimes to break out of the economics teaching that we had, and if we're honest, it wasn't all good, don't get me wrong, I had some really good, good teachers, but recognizing, and I think um, my colleague John mentioned the 
difference i think post pandemic there, there's definitely a, a change i think you would agree in the the mindset of students post pandemic and we need to do everything we can do, we can to engage students with our discipline and have the confidence that we don't need to go into a classroom constantly beating our chest and showing we're a good economist by giving them you know just a pure technical diet that's not to say that you ditch a technical diet completely because there is a role for that but we need to show the relevance we need to have the confidence and I think that for me is one of the issues I'm not sure often we have the confidence because we we we, um, we worry that we're being sort of watched and um, perhaps um, judged by our peers by a set of standards and not perhaps by the attributes we want our students to uh, subsequently demonstrate so for me it's it's about thinking about as I say, what, what do economists actually do in the real world? Why don't we have the confidence to teach our own students in a way that shows and highlights why economics, why we love economics, why we came into economics? So for me, it was that really dark moment with my um, sports scientists were thinking, why am they coming to a Garrett class, you know, and not getting uh, or, or, or not seeing me show them why economics was relevant to their world? Um, and if I told you what I was doing, I know I'm talking too much. I was drawing isoquants and ice cost lines for non-specialist economists. And I can see Elizabeth kick. It's probably not the best way, is it, <laughs> to that group? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll shut up for a minute. That's all right. That's what I'm going to be drawing tomorrow in my lecture. <laughs> to oh, no. my students. Um, well, I'll, I'll, in which case, I'll carry on then from what Dean has just been saying, because that was very much about what I was thinking of talking about as well. Oh, sorry. Because no 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 it's fine it's you know my um most of my teaching at the moment now is very technical um lots of sort of very quantitative mathematics isoquants isocross and solving those types of things but pretty much my favorite thing to teach and it's one of the reasons why i love being part of the um the textbooks is i love teaching economics to those without that background in economics um and trying to make it really relevant for them um, and I, I remember back at Exeter University, which is where I, I did my studying and started my teaching. And that's where I met John um, for the first time doing a, a video demonstrating how I used my econ lab um, in my uh, in my teaching and in the classroom. Um, and I was whilst I was teaching some students who were doing a straight economics degree, I was also teaching students doing management degrees, accounting and finance, marketing and one of my first lectures, I did um, I did a poll and was asking them, um, you know, who was excited about learning economics? And it was just a complete lack of any interest <laughs> in economics. It was just this general, why do I have to be here? Mm -hmm. It's not relevant to me. I'm not going to be an economist. I want to do marketing or I want to do this. I want to go into management. I don't need economics. And it was almost just this oh my God, what, what on earth do I do? How am I going to engage you as a group of students when you've clearly got zero interest in economics? Um, and I think for me, it was a bit like, a, as Dean was talking about, it was trying to find a way to actually empathize with them and try to find something that they could latch onto and find it interesting. Um, and it, it took time. And I, I remember coming into a lecture and there were sort of students milling around outside and they were having a, a chat. There was a group of students who were having a chat one day um, and they were basically saying how they were going to be leaving early to go home for the holidays. Um, and they were going to be having to leave sort of a week or so before term ended because flights were so much cheaper then. Um, and it, it was suddenly just clicked. And I was like, OK, almost let's just scrap what I was going to do in today's lecture. You know, let's get rid of all my PowerPoint slides. Um, and instead, I basically just went in and just started to chat about flights and why um, why some <laughs> students were going to be leaving early um, and really just trying to get students to do what John was saying, sort of talk to each other during the session, asking them to think about their own travel experiences. Um, you know, most of them travel fairly regularly. There were lots of international students. Um, and they were therefore able to talk about lots of different aspects of the airline industry. And you may have noticed through the books, there is sort of a bit of a, a theme in some of the boxes that I write about different aspects of the airline industry. And by getting them to think about their own experiences, you know, we were able to cover things like, um, you know, oil prices 
and how that impacted um, the price of flights, the costs, the profits, um, some strike action, um, you know, why routes going from A to B were so much more expensive than going from A to C, why they were different prices depending on when you purchase the seats. And it was as if the students were suddenly thinking, actually, I wonder if economics might actually be relevant to me. I wonder if there are different things within my life where actually if I just think about them in a slightly different way, I can actually see of economics. And it's something that I started to do within my teaching. As like I said, I don't really teach um, that much to non-economists now. Um, but when I was doing it a couple of years ago, it was something I really wanted to try to do. And, and that's what I hope I do in the the, the boxes within the textbooks as well, is try and make the case studies and the, the boxes a slightly different way of teaching the core theory. So almost rather than teaching students, as Dean just said, ISO quants, ISO costs, um, or you know, drawing out demand and supply curves or talking about game theory and actually teaching them the theory, what I think is a nicer way to do it is to get them to think about different aspects, whether it's the airline industry, um, you know, whether it's about, um, for me, Formula One, love Formula One, um, and racing, going overtaking on the track and getting to think about different things which they see in everyday life, and then go back to that and then say, okay, well, all these things that we've just been talking about, you're interested in, let's now think about the economics behind them. Um, and so, you know, rather than teaching them the core theory, and then giving them an application, I often try and do it the other way around. You know, tell me about, you know, why slice of pizza you like the best when you go into a into a pizza restaurant, which is the best slice. So which one are you going to be prepared to pay the highest price for? And so by them telling me their own experiences, that then means I can then say, well, actually, you've just told me about, you know, what the demand curve might look like or why certain um, airline tickets are more expensive than others. And I think that's a really, really important thing to do in, in teaching, especially to non-specialists, to try and get them engaged in the subject so that they actually see the relevance of, of, of what they're learning. Um, for me, you know, that's something I try and do within the textbooks as well, but also within my teaching. And I think I'll now shut up and hand, hand back to Emma. <laughs> I was going to say, no, it just links beautifully to the, as I say, maybe what John's about to say, particularly to do with the blogs and also the news site of, you know, we're in a really fantastic position that we have the free resources online that show up to date, really relevant examples of how economics is relevant to all of these students. So if you're looking for examples, then we have an awful lot right there. Here we go. Perfect timing. I'll, so I'll this is an example of, of the news site, and this is the latest posting on inflation and fiscal drag. So for those not in the UK, we've just had what's called the autumn statement, which is a bit like the budget where the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister, is laying out government plans for expenditure and taxation. And he announced a cut in the national insurance rate from 12% to 10%. Again, not from the UK, the national insurance is sort of like the social security tax for, for, for pensions and um, so it's a form a bit like income tax and it was hailed as a tax cut. But when you look at the data, because we've had inflation and because nominal incomes are growing, people are gradually getting to higher, higher tax brackets. And in fact, they're ending up paying more tax because those uh, various brackets haven't been adjusted. Those nominal tax brackets haven't been adjusted for inflation. So, in fact, what was hailed as a tax cut, people are actually seeing that they're paying more and more and more in tax. So that's what this, uh, this thing on fiscal drag is about. And there's a lot of data there. Look at the various tax bands. Um, there's a graph there which you can download as PowerPoint. So if you if you just want to see the PowerPoint, version, there's a link to the, to the sources there, the public finance sources. Uh, then there are various uh, two quite good videos on it. There, there's some a series of articles and then some data um, and then some questions on it. So this is typical of how the news site will work with a current news item discussing it, questions, articles. And, and that's a free resource which is available on the free student website. Let me just show you one other thing. And that's that's this. Um, let me just get it 
Rather nice cartoon I came across some time ago. Um, this is a, a Peanuts cartoon. So we've got Snoopy. You might as well just read it. I like that, John. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing we try and do is to, in the books, encourage students to find out. It's a form of elementary research. So, you know, economists as researchers, they'd like students to do some research too. Now that doesn't mean to necessarily have it at a high level. Right from the start, students can find out. In fact, even in primary school, the most of, some of the most effective learning is for students to find things out. You get a, a table in the middle and all sorts of stuff with little kids put things on and they find out what's this and find out what's that. Well, it's the same principle. And so for all the case studies, on the internet and all the all the um, boxes in the books, we have finding out sessions and activity sessions for students to really encourage this aspect of learning. So again, if I can just show you. So here we are. Um, this one in. Let's put it on full screen. So here's one, for example, on free trade and the environment. So students are asked to search for disputes that have been lodged with the WTO and to examine this uh, disputes and look at the arguments. Then they can do it as a group exercise. Here's another one on the attributes of money to look at various forms of cashless payments, to what extent they count as money or as an access to money, and guess, getting students to think about the concept of money and to what extent cashless payments meet various requirements for being a good form of access to money. Um, here's another one about uh, a, a, a case study on uh, B2B uh, marketplaces, um, business to business online marketplaces and asking students to investigate a particular B2B marketplace and a series of points, series of questions for them to find out. Here's a long one, which I won't go through all it through, but it's essentially getting students to look at fixed and variable costs and marginal costs um, in their own university, on their courses, and to what extent you get economies of scale by having big classes, big courses, and it, is it in the university's interest? So should your establishment take on extra students? Um, should some courses expand relative to the others? What is the unit of resource for your course? Um, how would you assess the efficiency of an establishment? So trying to get students to use their own environment and name their university or their course to look at some of the, the concepts in economics. So just a few examples. And every single one of the case studies, and we've got, oh, well over 100 case studies for each book, um, have all these activities associated with them. Absolutely. And in the Revel, uh, we also have, you know, videos and extra, as we talked about kind of multimedia, how to engage students in different ways. And we know that, you know, different students react much more visually or prefer the audio. So again, any way that we can try and really get them excited about economics is only a good thing. What I would stress is the importance of students accessing data. And Dean's very much on the page there. We call him Data Dean. Um, but uh uh, get That's one of the nicer things you call me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I'll, say, I'll say the rest for another time. Um, yes, to getting students to look mm. at data. And uh, one really useful source, I say it's useful because I, I do it myself, is is um, a, a date, data site on the Economics Network site. Um, can I just show you that? Um, where is it? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Hmm, I don't seem to have it up. Never mind. But we have a, a on the Economics Network site, which I would really recommend you look at the whole series of resources available in terms of improving your teaching. Um, there is a free data site, they can easily find it, with uh, 
nearly 50 sources of data and each source looking at various sections so you can download data to use with your students or get the students to download the data manipulate them in excel writing reports how they relate to economics and so on and that's a really valuable form simple research skill you can develop in your students and again it's making it more fun it's learning by doing rather than mm. learning old i've just put the link john in the chat for people to to access oh, that you. um i mean i just echo what john has said um the, well there's two 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 important points i think data sometimes can be quite frightening to to some students particularly i think when they first come to university and trying to get my head around i think over the years why that can be is they sometimes naturally associate the use of data with very complex analysis or very complex tools econometrics i guess in part and actually trying to develop student confidence working with data i think is a very important transferable skill because wherever these students go in terms of career it's very likely I think that at some point they will be working with data so giving them the confidence I think that's a really a really valuable skill to learn but I also think um, data are a fantastic way of stimulating discussion because they tend to raise questions they're a fantastic way of motivating an, an issue as well as then helping to conduct the analysis itself. I think data lend themselves uh, in a really nice way for developing students' sort of skills in research and being help, able to, to develop curiosity. I was showing my second years um, a chart, not, not unrelated to the blog that John was writing about um, the, the growth in um, the tax burden over recent years and data can be a very good way as i say of motivating questions and i said two things and two become three that sounds like a bad pop song doesn't it um <laughs> but um the day-to-day -day job of a lot of um professional economists is actually working with data and often working in ways in which they're essentially telling a story Data are a fantastic way of getting students to develop storytelling. And I think that's something that we should do, do much better at. Uh, and as I say, try and dispel the myth that data or get, get rid of this notion that some students have that data is hard, that data is frightening. I don't know if my colleagues know what I'm referring to, yeah. whether or not they see that with, with some students, this sort of fear of, of data. I just wonder if it's worth just, there's a few comments in the chat about um, teaching to non-specialists in particular. Oh, okay. yep. And um, I think I think I just want to go back to something Elizabeth said on this, that, um, I mean, it's, you've got to be quite brave to do it. But you, we tend to think of, I think a lot of people think of economics as a sort of content rather than a way of thinking. And it might yep. be just quite useful to ask I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm guessing what would be interesting to the students, but I don't. I wouldn't know unless I asked them. Mm. And it might be interesting in your courses to ask the students what they're interested in, what mm. issues that, that they've got mm. a particular focus in, and then maybe you can choose some of those and apply a sort of economic way of thinking to those tasks mm. rather than, you know, I think the point that Dean raised. I do think there's a certain pressure that comes from the discipline just to just to deliver a stripped down version of a traditional micro macro one course to non-specialists rather than trying to uh, tailor it to that particular audience um, so one really brave thing would be to actually ask the students maybe poll them on a free texting and get them to, to, to say well, what issues have they got a particular interest in and see if you could choose some of those and see if you could apply economic reasoning to them, the same old toolkit, the same old things that we use, incentives, trade-offs, opportunity costs, thinking at the margin. We, you know, we could apply those to all these, uh, or if it's just about any any choice decision that, that, that we're facing. In terms of the, so I, I don't know, I'm, this is completely mind reading, but if, if, I, if I didn't ask the students, there's just a couple of topics that if you said to me, I had mm. to, because one of the questions was specifically about computer scientists. Mm -hmm. And if you were to say to me, oh, OK, I, I, off the top of my head, what, what, what do I think might interest them? Although I don't know this for sure. 
what one one area that would spring to mind is there's quite a lot there's an interesting discussion about the role of personalized pricing online so to what extent uh is your online behavior because it can be monitored obviously through algorithms what you're looking at what websites you're looking at to what extent um can do, well can or should firms or organizations do that to personalize the prices that you see so basically charge different people different prices for the same basic product um, and obviously with the ability of data scientists and big data to analyze these data sets this is probably it's probably possible to tailor this in a way that's never been possible before and what's very interesting, if you ask groups of people about personalized pricing, to go back to John's idea of trying to get people to think about issues, I suspect if you were to poll the class, a number of them would say it's illegal. Mm. And it's not illegal. And then that leads into an interesting discussion about whether it should be made illegal or legal and what the pros and cons of this might um, be. So I think, and there's, a, there's, there's some stuff in the book. There's a, there's a box in chapter eight, I know from memory, because I wrote it, that looked at personalized pricing and there's a load of resources and links with that. So without, I, I, I suspect that might be an area that might get computer scientists uh, more interested. Um, I think the other thing and the other area that I think I'm, it's not, I, I don't think this is just for computer scientists, but I'm increasingly self-conscious that I don't talk enough about because it reflects the real world. And that's digital platforms and the role of of uh, these two sided platforms, like Amazon or Google or social media. And there's lots mm. of you can you can take that basic toolkit and you can apply it to these two sided platforms and talk about network externalities. And I think that, that again, I suspect that might be of more interest to that group of students mm. rather than just going do your, your bog standard list of stuff. But ultimately, I, I don't know. I think I think you'd you'd have to ask them. Mm. and see if you could pick some of the topics, some of the things I've come up with, like Elizabeth suggested in her example, and see if you could say, well, okay, let's see if we can have a go at applying some okay. of this toolkit to these ideas. Absolutely. I mean, you were there was, oh, sorry, John, there was another oh, question no, 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 around linking sorry. to legal frameworks. So I wonder if there was anything else to kind of note from the legal framework side. It sounds like someone is combining... Uh, business environment and legal frameworks at undergraduate level one. And they were wondering if there was any advice on what macroeconomics content might be most suitable, particularly linking to the legal framework part. It's macro, that's Dean. So yeah. it's all, all yours, <laughs> Dean. Um, I think I, I, I'm not going to pretend to be a, a legal expert, um, but I think the, the sort of overriding issue, if I step back here it, and I'm sort of supportive of what John said that actually asking your, your students is a good way in mm. but we have a series of um, threshold concepts don't we in economics that might be a, a useful vehicle for thinking right these are the sort of fundamental ideas that we have in this discipline that help us to think like an economist now I, I don't know how long these modules are whether a seminar or a year long but I think I think the way into this is thinking right it's not just about the content the content's important and i say the threshold concepts might be a way into thinking right these are um several things that i might want to demonstrate and evidence but it's how i'm going to teach i think sometimes we get too bogged down in what i'm going to teach don't get me wrong it's important but particularly with non-specialists i think the lesson i've learned it's more about how we actually go about doing the the te they're the threshold concepts Brilliant. so certainly in in you know in macro if if i was to, to demonstrate to non-specialists one one key thing i think it would be the the idea that economies are in you know inherently um volatile the short short-term growth for the country tends to fluctuate and i think that is nicely um evident to this group of students because gosh through their through their lifetime they've lived through how many um, once in a lifetime crises um they've lived through the financial crisis they've lived through the pandemic the cost of living crisis so i, I think the threshold concepts might be a useful vehicle for thinking about mm. how you then you know um not just teach or decide on what you're going to teach, but as I say, I'm repeating myself here, I think it's as much about how you do the the teaching. And from the micro side as well, I'm aware we've talked about macro, 
And of course, one of the, one of the things that we've really prided ourselves on is having a really good combination of both. I know other other resources mm. available maybe have more of a preference towards one over the other. But if we've got any particular points to make around the micro side compared with macro. I mean, I guess well, I'm... I'm Oh, sorry, John. I, I was just going to say on a couple of things, I think going back to the computer science um, question as well, which, you know, so many of our students are now thinking about going into careers, lots of graduate jobs, many of which require some form of data science, some understanding of, of coding and computer science. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think trying to make sure that Computer scientists understand economics and economists understand the role of computer science is so, so important. Um, and I just think, I think it's really interesting in, in sort of almost thinking about it that sort of economics is a way of developing models, whether it's a micro model, a macro model, whatever mm. it might be. And then the, com the computer scientists have like the algorithms, they have the coding ability to actually test those theories and provide um, that way of actually working out whether something is accurate, is it a, um, a way of reflecting the world? Um, and I think John was right about things like networks and network externalities is something that computer scientists, um, you know, would find interesting and useful, as well as things like game theory um, and you know, things like, um, I guess, COVID vaccinations, um, you know, and thinking about um, ways in which you can use big data to actually look at um, the decision making process that people make on getting vaccinations. Going on to the legal frame. Sorry, John. <laughs> I'm just saying, of course, now AI. I mean, this is such such a big thing, and we're both within computer science and and within the e economics and education, all three. Yeah, and then the only other thing I would say on the sort of the legal framework is, you know, one thing I find really interesting on the micro side is trying to get sort of students to not necessarily think about what the current legal framework actually is, but what do they think perhaps it should actually be? Mm -hmm. You know, so whether it's talking about, um, you know, making it currently illegal drugs legal and actually thinking about the fact that, you know, we know that in lots of countries they are illegal, um, you know, but what might be some of the economic arguments for actually legalising some of them? You know, and it's, it provides some really interesting um, ways to think about lots of different concepts within economics. Um, whether it might be sort of underground markets developing, how demand curves and supply curves might change, how it might change the quality of drugs, the impact on healthcare, the impact on crime. There are so many different extensions you could think mm. about through just talking about, you know, should cigarettes be made uh, um, illegal? Should there be a ban on cigarettes? So we've seen the very recent reversal in New Zealand, mm. you know, so talking about really recent policy and sort of the legal framework around that. I think would be sort of an interesting way of bringing together the economics and the the legal side but also just sort of competition policy and regulation and just different ways of regulating work uh, markets you know what's right what's wrong how does it work what's the best approach and just getting students to sort of think about the the economics behind some of those decisions so that's how i would sort of think about trying to bring those two sort of sides together yeah i and think to, i think i'm oh, sorry immediately i i the first thing I thought of was competition policy, because when I, I think of law and economics, that seems to be the, the sort of obvious area where's that where that says overlap about the legal regulations, about things like the control of market power and what firms can and can't do and how those laws are implemented. And I suppose the last thing I it's not, it's, you know, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in this area, but fundamentally, you know, you're, you're, you're probably going to find it difficult in a course to not talk about at some point market exchange. And the important role that the established system of property rights, you can't, yeah. markets can't work. And I think this was the case in some of the attempts when some of the Eastern Bloc countries tried to introduce market reforms. I think what they discovered was without having an established legal framework in place, a mm. sort of set of rules to manage those market transactions, it, it just won't work very effectively. So I think almost looking at some of the, the very fundamentals and and I think probably we're a little bit guilty of just sort of brushing over the property rights and maybe with, with, right. with people with that legal background, that might be an area where I think I'd probably perhaps dig into it a, a little bit more. So those are they're the two key things are, that, that come to my mind. One very quick example that sort of links micro and macro, because I think also with non-special, well, actually, maybe this is true across the discipline sometimes that we, we we overplay don't we the distinction between micro and macro i know john and i tease each other all the 
all the time about which one's superior, etc. But I was thinking about um, the instability that the financial system creates and some of the responses. I mean, Elizabeth was talking about, right, what should the, the framework, the legal framework around financial institutions? We've had ring fencing, haven't we, between the sort of retail banking arm and the sort of um, investment banking arms of institutions and a sort of legal framework placed um, or introduced to try and um, affect the behavior of institutions at a micro level because it has clear macro implications so maybe that would be another example that the, the person who asked that question might be interested in and I think that example yeah, and, and internationally under the Basel arrangement uh, not just a national thing yeah and I think while we're talking of non-specialists, a question that's come up that I know I hear very regularly is around those students who are really anti-mathematics. And, you know, we've talked about yeah. leaning into your students' interests and, you know, we're not claiming that you can never, ever touch on it, but particularly talking around data. Have you got any advice for those people yeah. who are teaching those who are very much anti-leaning into the mathematics? I think there's a lot you can do with data without necessarily needing high-powered mathematics. So students can look at data sets, they, they can plot the figures, they can put them into an Excel, mm. uh, like they can just, you know, do simple things like finding averages and, 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 and so on. So, you know, they can manipulate the data in a very simple way. Mm. So then they can write a report, they can discuss what is coming out of the data and how it relates to the world and how it relates to the economic problems they're talking about. And you don't need a high powered mathematics to do that, but you do need to be familiar with numbers, familiar with data sets. And for non-mathematical students, it's a fantastic skill to develop that. Mm. I think, I think I think one thing I would say is, um, so I, I used to teach a module to loads of joint degree students who are exactly like that. They hated the mathematics side. For me, I would always say, you know, there are there are often three ways of looking at or solving a problem. One is to understand it intuitively and just think about the actual problem, the economic reasoning behind it. Another would often be to do it, you know, analyze it using a graph. Another way would be to solve it mathematically, and that everyone's going to have their own preference, their own way of understanding the problem. And for me, I think the best way to do is pick the way that you find the easiest to understand the problem. You know, that might be I understand the graph. Then think about, OK, well, what's the intuition behind it? And then at the very end, hopefully now you've understood the problem, you can now look at the mathematics and look at the data. And as John said, there are some really simple things you can do You're just using an Excel spreadsheet to understand and use the data. And I think if you understand what you're trying to show with the data, because you understand the intuition behind it, the economic thought behind it, it makes understanding the mathematics and the numbers slightly easier. I think the theme here for all of the non-specialists is how do you make economics less scary? Because I think what, what we're all aware of is actually it's fascinating and there's a lot to get very excited about. Um, there's another question here, which is really interesting around case studies and how you develop case studies and how you would approach that kind of starting place. So in particular, talking about how there tend to be far more case studies around the US, EU, UK and less around kind of Middle Eastern countries. If you were wanting to build a bank of additional case studies, what advice would you give someone on where where and how to approach that? Well, it depends whether you're talking about writing studies or whether you're talking about drawing on a bank of existing case studies. Sorry, my battery's just going down. I'm just having to plug it back in. Not a problem. Just don't don't start going to clean your windows. So yeah, everyone should stretch right. after we've been sitting down for too long. And we'll have a, we'll have a break. <laughs> have you seen the saying. famous video of the team's call at the Scottish Council meeting? You'll have seen the picture of the woman going to clean her windows halfway through Brilliant. the council meeting. Which yes, was, uh, okay. On the BBC, on the BBC <laughs> website, wonderful. <laughs> so yes, it depends whether there, there is. You're talking about writing your own case studies, in which case you can look at case studies from other countries where there is one and just amend them in the, in, in the light of the particular country you're talking about. Um, or, I mean, I, I don't have the knowledge here to to find to talk about sources of, of, of specific cases, but a, a, a good place to start is newspapers and magazines for that particular country and look at online sources from particular organizations in that country, a central bank, um, mm. macro ones, uh, or major companies at that country, if you want some micro information, 
So, I mean, it, it, it th there will be the information there. Obviously, it always comes with the health warning of just how reliable the data are. But nevertheless, I, I think there should be plenty of information for most countries to be able to build simple case studies. And if if it's doing it yourself, then then just amend something from another country, but using different data and maybe you know, different cultural references and so on. Okay, next, uh, a much more idealistic question here, which I think is brilliant, of although we don't necessarily get to decide exactly how we want to teach, in an ideal world, what would your optimum combination of lectures, seminars, practicals and videos be for teaching economics? Who would like to go first? <laughs> Everyone's gone, oh, can you imagine having the freedom? It would yeah. be... Suddenly, you, you're you're asking a group of economists to not have constraints on them when they're. I know it's very dangerous. It's not, it's we not we my need, question. Need, I wouldn't. I wouldn't risk we it. We need constraints. That's how we operate. <laughs> um, I I it it depends on the course. I suppose it depends on you might have a difference between a sort of more data heavy course and a and a more yeah. standard course. If I had complete freedom, wow! I quite like the idea of ninety minute classes. I like the idea that it, I always find it difficult to, to do as much as I want to do in a 50, because in effect, 60 minutes is 50 minutes with a turnover. So I think I'd have a 90 minute slot. I'd probably always want students in groups of about 40 or 50, and I'd want them doing stuff. Um, and I'd probably want to kick off it. So I'd, I'd probably scrap everything and just have 90 minute workshops. Mm. Uh, with about 40, 50 students in it. If I could have anything, that's probably for a course what I would do. But I, you've thrown me by giving me all this freedom. I know. I, was gonna say that's, that's I would do something job. very, very different. I would say, what are the learning objectives? And something mm. you would quite happily do in a large class because you get the economies of scale in a large class. And that could be giving information. It could be um, looking at what's going on in the world. It could be students working through simple technical problems, what they can do with, with, with a, a voting system, a polling system, and other things where you want students in smaller groups so they can discuss and talk about policy. Um, and so I, I, I like the idea of different classes. It depends on the learning objectives of those classes. What is bad is where the wrong class is used for the wrong thing. The worst use of seminars is to give a mini lecture in a seminar. Mm. What is the point of having a class of... 15 students uh, when you could have do exactly the same with a class of 300 students so it is horses for courses it's the sort of you need if i ideally i would have different size classes for 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 different sorts of activities i have to go because i've got another meeting but i would just say very quickly i would go for my very technical mathematical course i'd go for some pre-recorded videos to get rid of all the boring stuff of solving mm. optimization problems done and then i'd have hour-long workshops with sort of 50 60 students in where i could go through and do some exercises work through problems and then i'd have classes as well with maybe 10 to 15 students where they have to work in groups to solve different problems and discuss different things but i very much agree that it is entirely dependent on what are the learning outcomes, objectives, and the type of thing that's being taught there. I'm very, very sorry that I'm going to have no, to disappear. No, not at all, there. thank you. <laughs> and it just goes to show there is no one right way to do it. There are many different ways to do things and, and many brilliant ways to do things. So thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we can carry on for another couple of minutes if people are happy to overrun. Uh, there's a couple more questions that will come through. And if anyone has anything else, please do put them in the chat. There's one here, which again is looking beyond the teaching, um, which is somebody who has started on their PhD research as they graduate from their master's degree in finance. And they are wondering what you would recommend between getting professional experience or going straight into their PhD. Do you think that there is a better way of doing it or it's very much personal preference? Um, well, I'll take this one given that I have gone down the professional route I, I think it's it really it will depend on the the individual but what I will say is in terms of the positive impact that having had it was a relatively short period up to four years working for the government economic service it has had such an influential and positive impact on my career that I would encourage anyone um, to consider that I think in terms of how it affects my performance in the classroom, what I do with the students, and also 
they the number of students who will come to you and actually have a conversation about careers as professional mm-hmm. economists because you've done it yourself is really really fascinating I get lots of students and I know you do too John don't you from working with the government economic service doing um, assessment centers so for me it was an invaluable experience and as hopefully as I say contributed positively to what I now do and close that gap I suppose that's the main thing for me it's helped me to close the gap between the world of academic and professional economics so I would encourage encourage that but I know that it, it can get more difficult to go back into the world of academia mm. the longer you've been out of it I do appreciate that brilliant and then a question that I'm fascinated to hear the answer to is how do you think that your experience as book authors has affected your teaching and practice of economics I think it makes you focus on the learning process mm. um and when you have to struggle to write something clearly so you really understand it unambiguously, then it does help you get inside students' heads at learning that. It also make, makes you constantly think, OK, so have the students understood what's been written? What question would you ask? So that's one of the reasons why we've got questions interspersed throughout all the textbooks. We call them pause for thought or... Mm-hmm. You know, isn't it? But it, it's it's all about reflective learning. So mm. you learn something and then you have to apply it. At the sort of typical what if question. Ah, oh, yes, but if you change the parameters, what if this? Or the negative of something. What if that didn't happen? And so on. Um, and I think so writing books constantly makes you think like that. Then it also, when you have to think about um the sort of subsidiary materials, because we write all our own subsidiary materials uh, to go on the website. Doing those, what else do students need in terms of case studies? We've got videos and, you know, to, to help you learn, so you can keep replaying those little vid- theoretical videos. Um, it's all about trying to get inside students' heads. What do they need? So I think writing textbooks really does help you empathise with, with mm. student learning process. I, I think for me quickly, you know, you think you understand stuff as a student and then you teach it and you realise you didn't understand it as a student and you start teaching it. And then when you write a textbook, you realise you didn't really fully understand what you were teaching. Um, so when you start having to write stuff, it really does make you. We, we always have a joke between the three of us about little niggles that crop mm. up when we're writing and little things that don't. And you think, wow, I thought I understood this stuff. And as John says, you go through that thought process in a very structured way when you're writing a book. And it makes you really think about how people learn this stuff. It, do, it does it in a way that just teaching in the classroom didn't, didn't do for me. Um, it really did make me think very, very carefully about how, how some of the models and the theories built up. So, um, yes, I've gone. It certainly made me understand a lot of things that I thought I understood uh, a lot more. And I think one of the positive things is it obviously because the books and our resources are so applied, you're constantly on the. It, it, I, I always joke with people, I have this advantage being involved with a book that I've just got this head full of up to date applications uh, that I can I can use in teaching. They're just there because I've been doing them for the books or the blogs or the case studies uh, 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 or whatever. Um, for me, I, I mean, first thing, it's been an absolute, I suppose, privilege sounds a bit. Uh, OTT but I, I don't think it is it's been an absolute privilege to be involved in the books John will tell me how long I think I got involved back in 2000 I want to say 2006 7 um and I've Sounds about I, right yeah when we met down in Bristol I think um echoing what the two Johns has just said for me it's developing that intuitive insight into a concept a model um and actually, going back to something I said earlier, I think we often are in danger of not placing enough weight or emphasis on intuition. I think Elizabeth said that just before she had to leave. And certainly, I think economists need to do better in conveying the intuition behind their discipline, behind their explanations of particular phenomena, particularly with, with non-specialists. So I think it's the intuition or the ability to communicate more straightforwardly. And as an economist, I can actually say that with a smile because being able to communicate straightforwardly is something that we should all be proud of, I think, rather than thinking it's um, 
uh, a poor, you know, it's, it's not a value, it's of considerable value. I think I think um, the two Johns would agree being able to intuitively explain things is invaluable and we don't place enough weight on it, I think. And also just to um, just build on what Dean said, what I also love about economics is that just, and what gets gets people going, I think, is just sometimes that intuition of the economist can be mm. counterintuitive to what the general public believes or what is yeah, common thought. And that, that is great when you can sort of say, I don't know, I could say I, I might do it to, to raise the debate, but do you think that uh, uh, ticket touts or people reselling tickets are a good thing for society or a bad thing for society? And you can challenge some pre-held views that people might have with some economic theory. So sometimes I think the beauty of economics is when it gives it, it's, it's logic and it's reasoning gives a counterintuitive uh, 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 result to what a lot of people might might think. San Costa, a classic example of that. Yeah, 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 yeah they're good. Well, thank you so much. I think we've all got some really valuable thoughts to take with us today. So I want to thank everyone for joining and participating. And of course, a huge thanks to John, John, Dean and Elizabeth for joining and sharing your knowledge today. It's been so appreciated. Um, so in terms of next steps, we'll be in touch with everybody after this with two different emails. One will be giving you information about how you can get in touch with us at Pearson uh, to be able to get copies of the books, a demonstration of some of the courseware. So we've talked a little bit today about the Revel and the My Labs. Um, and also, if you want to have any kind of consultations or conversations around these, we'll be very happy to help. The second email will come in about a week and um, that will have a link to today's recording and a summary of the webinar today. So just from me, a huge thank you to everyone for attending and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. So thanks again. Thank you. Everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks everybody.